thanks already everybody for joining. We'll just wait for another uh, one or two minutes to let people join this morning. Thank you. So good morning, good uh, day and good afternoon and evening, everyone. Uh, we are very happy to, um, that you've joined us today in our online session here at the um, Stockholm Water <laughs> Week, closing the last mile, people-centric fl uh, flood and drought early warning systems, where we have prepared a very interactive session for you, uh, featuring several experts in the fields of flood and drought. And uh, just be prepared, we're gonna have some instant polling on the session. And also if you have any comments or questions, uh, please just put them into the Zoom chat or also <laughs> the Pathable chat. My name is Katrin Ehlert. Uh, I work at the World Meteorological Organization. And uh, I'll give it over to my colleague now, Valentin Arnold. Thank you very much, Katrin, for the kind introduction. My name is, as Katrin said, is Valentin. And yeah, we are facilitating this session today for you. And we're very much uh, looking forward because we have some uh, very uh, special speakers and guests today for you. Yeah, everybody is talking currently in Europe about uh, droughts because we are in the middle of what seems to be the worst drought in perhaps 500 years. And uh, at the same time, we see flooding happening all over the world as well, for example, with casualties in Afghanistan and uh, Colombia at the moment. Um, so I don't think we need really to talk about the urgency of, of our topic today. And um, also UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said this year that early warnings and actions save lives. And I think uh, we all agree that, that, that he is... Um, uh, yeah, totally right, of course, with that. And he announced that the World Meteorological Organization, WMO, would spearhead a new action to ensure every person on Earth is protected by early warning systems within the, uh, the, the next five years. And uh, early warning systems, of course, only help if they actually reach the people that, that, that need the warning. And also, what is also important is that people know how to react. And uh, this is what we want to talk about today, because with our both joint programs, um, APFM, the uh, Associated Program on Flood Management, and IDMP, the Integrated Drought Management Program, jointly uh, operated by uh, the WMO, the World Meteorological Organization, and the Global Water Partnership, GWP, we are really focusing on this people-centric approaches. And uh, yeah, therefore, we're really keen to get also a lot of your input today. And uh, yeah, for this, I'll already uh, give it back to you, Katri. Over to you. Thank you very much, Valentin. And uh, we'll jump right in to the first of our poll of questions. So we want to know from our audience, have you been trained on how to react to, flat warning, uh, to, flat, to a flat warning appropriately? So you have the options, yes, no, and partially. And you can see uh, here on top of the slides, um, the URL poliv.com 
slash GWP. And also in the chats, you can click on the link and answer the question. So this is really, really interesting to know everyone on the call. Have you been trained on how to react to a flood warning appropriately? In your country or maybe because where you work or where you live is situated in a risk area. There is a code that you can use to respond. It's also posted in the chat. You can see that most of the people have actually not been trained. Some people have partially been trained. It's also interesting to learn uh, what that means maybe. And, but some people say, yes, yes, we've been trained. So I think there are still some answers coming in, but really I think the, the main takeaway and what, what has been there from the start is that no, um, most of the people in our audience have not been trained to react to a flat warning. So maybe we can pass on to the next poll already. Um, so the next thing we would like to know from our audience today is, do you think this would be relevant for your work? And most people do think yes. And I think as soon as you are on polyf.com slash GWP, you'll be able to just pass on to the next question, which will be shown to you, which is, do you think this is or would be relevant for your work. It would be partially relevant, but no one says it would not be relevant. So yeah, a very, um, a very clear result actually, yes or partially. So, so very positive towards training uh, in, the reaction or the knowledge about how to react about, um, on flat early warning. So um, with, with these uh, insights into, into our audience, um, I have now um, the uh, pleasure to introduce uh, our first speakers, uh, experts on flood and drought management. So we have a first um, Professor uh, Paolo Reggiani, who holds the Chair of Water Resources Management and Climate Impact Research at the Department of Civil Engineering at the University of Siegen in Germany. Hi, Paolo, it's good to see Hello. you. <laughs> Paolo obtained his PhD degree from the Center for Water Research at the University of Western Australia in 1999. And prior to that, prior to joining the University of Siegen, he held the position of Senior Water Resources Specialist at Deltares um, in Delft, the Netherlands. So, Paolo, um, we're um, keen on hearing uh, about the, the recent flood in Germany. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, it's um, hard to. Um, oh, you to mute it. it. Okay. No, I'm not. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Go ahead. Sorry, Paul. Okay. Yeah. So it's uh, hard to imagine uh, seeing this drought uh, that we are uh, living through right now. That it's just uh, twelve months ago that we had a terrible uh flood events hitting uh, various parts of germany last year yeah and one of the uh, biggest biggest events of last year is the river r flood um the river r is a very small uh, relatively small uh, basin yeah that uh, we can change the next slide yeah yeah it's a very small basin not far from bonn and cologne uh, on the left-hand side of the River Rhine. And um, 
this basin was hit by um, a very extreme precipitation event, yeah, statistically very rare, yeah, that led to a precipitation amount of about 150 to 200 liters per square meters in 24 hours. Yeah. This led to this cause that the discharge in this river that is usually on long-term average about 10 cubic meters per second, yeah, was inflated up to 900 cubic meters per second. This is about 10 times the average of the maxima that were recorded in the last 75 years. Yeah. The flood, the, 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 the power of this, uh, the, the destructive power of this river was so uh, um, large yeah, that it caused uh, houses to be flooded up to the second floor. And it caused a lot of casualties uh, um, with 135, 134, 134 people dead. Yeah. Now uh, the the problem, or what 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 of course uh, occupies the minds of people, is now could I have been avoided? Was that avoidable? And where where did things go wrong? Yeah. And for sure, we can say one thing, yeah, that there were alerts, that the alert system, the warning systems worked very well. We had two levels of warning. Yeah, we have in Europe a pre-warning system that is run by the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecast that forecasted this flood already nearly a week ahead. And then we have a fine-grained system at the state level in which this happened, yeah, that predicted you know, exceptional water levels of several meters above uh, normal uh, normal uh, water levels. So something uh, very dangerous about go was going to approach uh, that that river basin. Yeah. So uh, from that perspective, or from a technical modeling perspective, uh, authorities very well were very well warned ahead of time. Moreover, we have to mention yeah, that these floods are not that unfrequent there statistically. Yeah? I mean, for instance, 1910, there was a very large flood already in the same basin. It is even photographically recorded from pictures from the time. And uh, another uh, uh, 70 or 80 years earlier, there was another flood at 1804. Yeah, that uh, that caused even was even more destructive. Yeah, so we have on average about every seventy years an extreme event hitting this basin. Can go uh, to the next slide. So well, what went wrong? Yeah. So uh, we can now a posteriori uh, for sure say that the communication chain has uh, has failed. So the warnings reached authorities, but authorities underestimated the danger and failed to issue warnings to the population. Or also warnings, as soon as they, when they arrived, they were too late. Yeah, and people found themselves unprepared, battling by themselves yeah, against this, this, uh, this uh, extreme event. Yeah. Another issue that we, we need to keep in mind is that the history, the memory of people with respect to such events is very short. Yeah. We see on average the last 200 years, every 70 years, such an event has happened. Still people or people, of course, that haven't lived through such an event in their lifetimes consider themselves safe yeah. or could not imagine, could not fathom yeah, that this would happen to them. Yeah. For instance, what, what, what has that led to? Yeah, that for instance, new buildings were constructed very few years, uh, very few years ago in areas close to the river, in, uh, in, 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 uh, uh, in fields, in areas that were considered safe to, with respect to floods that occur statistically one in a hundred years. Yeah. The, the 21 flood was instead four times higher than the average one in a hundred year flood, which is about 230 square cubic meters per second. Yeah. Of course, a early warning could not have saved houses and bridges and railways being destroyed like we're seeing here in those pictures, but one thing they could surely have done and that is prevented the, 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 the loss of life. Yeah, I mean, it was the largest flood disaster in terms of lost life since World War II in Germany. Yeah. Another thing is that, of course, statistically, such a flood can happen again. Yeah. And we know that climate change, for instance, is increasing 
the the frequency yeah, of extreme events so it is not unlikely that in the next 10 15 20 years such a flood might again hit the same area or other similar basins in the vicinity yeah and we should also keep in mind that what we have learned here is that for is especially uh, communication networks yeah uh, gsm telephone mobile phones electricity power everything was gone within short time so there was it was very difficult to reach people basically impossible yeah so and uh, yeah for uh, there's a lot of course which we could say we have it we, have, we could analyze this case but i would i'm happy to respond to specific questions then in the in the uh, in the q q and answer in the q and answer session thank you Thank you very much, Paolo. That's, um, that was a very good overview of this extreme event in Germany last year. I have now the pleasure to introduce um, Galina Stolina, um, who is a senior expert at the Scientific Information Center Interstate Coordination Water Commission in Central Asia. She has been working for more than 30 years in the water sector with a background in biology and soil sciences. She is more than 50 major publications to her name related to agroeconomics, the RLC, gender mainstreaming, water modeling, integrative water resources management, and other related issues. So Galina, we're very happy to have you on the call today and your contribution uh, on drought risk management. The floor is yours. <laughs> We can hear you, Galina. Go ahead. Yeah. Thanks. Can I start? Uh, Central Asia covers the territory of five uh, republics. You know, the Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan. It's located in the central of Yevra, uh, Asia with total area uh, three and point uh, eight eight square kilometers and population of over uh, 60 million people. And with um, <clears throat> over 82% uh, uh, population living in the RLC basin. The climate the regional is uh, expressed continent, continental, mostly the arid and semi-arid, and the average uh, annual precipitation is uh, 270 millimeters and between six and uh, eight millimeters uh, uh, in the mountain and uh, 80, 150 millimeters in desert zone. Central Asia is uh, <coughs> vulnerable to draw due to geographic location. And you can see the, the uh, percentage of uh, probability of drought in, in the different republics in Central Asia. And drought uh, in regional it's phenomenon, and even within the territory, the <coughs> assessment of uh, drought problems in the regional <coughs> monitoring models in Central Asia has shown that the geographical location in the regional determines the high exposure exposure to climate dri driving and natural disaster. About the 75 percentage of regional uh, of uh, area can be considered to uh, uh, sufferings uh, protected from disaster uh, of natural uh, character. The greatest number of uh, victims up to 70 percentage of total number of the in the regional and caused by uh, drought is the most uh, vulnerable uh, to droughts is Uzbekistan. And uh, um, in uh, this one is the example for impact uh, of 2000, 2000 uh, one drought in Uzbekistan. It was a decrease the serious uh, crop, uh, crop, uh, crop, uh, uh, cropping the series decreased by 10 percentage, cotton by uh, 17 percentage, rice by uh, <clears throat> uh, 
60 percentage and total loss estimate to uh, 130 million uh, millions, uh, USD. And the 94 percentage of farmers in Uzbekistan uh, experienced the drought related to the uh, shock. And the same time was the so the strong uh, drought was in Kazakhstan, uh, and in Kazakhstan uh, has uh, caused uh, massive uh, loss, uh, the uh, catastrophic of uh, livestock. Galina, I think you can continue with your second slide. I can continue? Yeah, continue, okay. please. Thanks. But uh, it's, I don't know why it was a close. And the uh, low water um, in the rivers of Uzbekistan is formed under the precipitation in the runoff formation zone and increased the air, air temperature during the snow accumulation. As an indicator of the hydrological drought in, uh, drought in Uzbekistan, conditions were accepted water availability for the growing season, April, September, uh, the value of water reserves in the snow cover in mountains area at the end of February and March. Given uh, then most of the 90 percentage in the lands as human irrigated, drought is reflected exactly here. How the climate change and water management are risk leading to drought. For example, in June 2020, first flow, flow in Amudaria, uh, Amudaria was a 24.5 percentage lower than 2019 and the 16.4 percentage lower than in 2020. And when the region started to suffer from the drought, March 2021, the level of the reservoir, the Tahtagul Reservoir, was 8 and 7.7 billion cubic meters and well below the storage capacity of 19.5 billion uh, cubic meters. I know that in the beginning of this vegetation period, the, <coughs> uh, the, uh, the level of the reservoir, Tahtagul, it was uh, some more than 7 uh, billion cubic, um, cubic uh, meters, but uh, now it's approximately 12 uh, billion cubic meters, but it means that it's a, it's a show that it's the drought now the, in the regional, it's a, we can see drought uh, condition. And the, now the new method, and you can see on the, uh, on the picture, you can see the, uh, the uh, water, <coughs> the charge, in uh, the Amudaria upstairs, uh, upstairs the river and downstreams, and this one also the same, but it's uh, the, uh, this time. And you can see the how they change the uh, discharge in uh, in the river. It means the the level close to the RLC is absolutely zero. And uh, we can explain it, uh, explain why this, uh, this situation now in the RLC. And uh, <clears throat> the method is a new method for uh, approach the forecasting hydrological uh, drought, drought in Uzbekistan. In the lower reach in Amudaria uh, <clears throat> River has been developed uh, for their 
first incorporation into the early drought warning system. Based on the combined use runoff modeling result in its formation zone and statistic approach, such as the regression and discriminant analysis, optimal evening method and <coughs> other. And uh, the problem, the main the meteorological parameters uh, is, is, uh, is the temperature and precipitation in this model are transformed uh, into drought indexes. And what is the problem? Uh, why is the problem? We have a problem the, uh, with the yearly uh, warning. And what is the problem? The problem is the density of monitoring network uh, too low, especially in the run-off formation zone. And <coughs> surface, surface uh, automatic hydrometeorological station, digital uh, data often not available, a limited data exchange between countries, and most vulnerable community not take into account and lack of capacity. And uh, Nina, what it's... Excuse me, we need you to wrap up um, in, in the next uh, half minute. Would that be okay? Can you hear me? It's... What? Galina, can you hear uh, me? Yeah. Sorry, hear. we're running out of time. Um, yeah, it's uh, one minute. Uh, it's, uh, just a moment, I will finish. And what it's, uh, we create- so, uh, uh, the, uh, Thanks a lot, Galina. I think there were uh, some issues at the end, but I think yeah, we got this very strong message of what uh, the problems are in okay. Central Asia, why there is yeah. no uh, forecasting system for droughts at the moment. And also the, the we could see the suggestions that you made with the conceptualization of a, of a, of a uh, joint uh, trigger for action, a, a drought index, and that there should be more coordination amongst the, 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 the riverine countries in the, in the Abu Dhabi uh, uh, basin. So thanks a lot, uh, Katrin already uh, uh, thanked Paolo. And I think this was quite striking what he presented. And Paolo, so uh, I have a first question for you. Um, yeah, you have already alluded a little bit what the problem was. I mean, you said there was a, the warning chain was there technologically. I think there is hardly a better system than the one that you explained in Europe. However, there were still so many deaths. You said there was a failure of communication and that people were not really know how to react. So can you perhaps a little bit elaborate more on what was the issue? Why did that not work in a country where you think industrialized like Germany, this should at least the people should be warned in time? Thank you. Yeah, this is... Thank you, Valentin. Yeah, this is what uh, 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 experts and courts and so forth now are trying to understand where, uh, why, why the message was not uh, transferred. Yeah, and uh, we, we know from a technical perspective, all the information was there to issue a warning. It should have been issued, but uh, I think the reason is very simple that authorities were not could not imagine, yeah, authorities, there were people that were not technically trained, the ministers weren't, the, 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 the administrative people weren't to understand what sort of risks lie, were lying ahead. Yeah, so they thought, no, uh, perhaps, so they, they could not imagine it, their, their, their memory didn't go back that far, so they could not imagine what, what sort of destruction was, was coming. Yeah, this from a top-down uh, side. From the other side, uh, the people themselves living in the area had no recollection anymore. Yeah. Moreover, the government, the, the local government, had given land blocks to young families that built houses in newly, uh, newly defined uh, construction zones that were very close to the river, that if the risks would have been known and yeah, should not have been designated for construction. Yeah, there were people that invested uh, several hundreds of thousands of euros in a new home that was completely destroyed, was built three years ago and was completely destroyed. Some of them were covered by insurance, some not. But people could not imagine that the water would reach the second floor of the homes. 
It is really a, 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 an event of biblical proportions in that small, small area. Yeah? And we need to, to, to consider that there are several such valleys, small basins that under circumstances like the one we had, like extreme meteorological circumstances, can turn into, so where you have extreme amounts of precipitation falling in a very short period of time, so in very few hours, in a day or in 12 hours, yeah, they lead to this type of extreme events. And they are statistically possible, they have been observed in the past and they will happen again. Yeah. And therefore, a, an awareness campaign needs to be started that, uh, that keeps people informed, that, 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 that explains to people with visual tools, with games, with, with, with all sorts of uh, information and communication and dissemination material that, 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 that visualizes the possible dangers. Yeah? And then, of course, people also need to be instructed what to do in such a situation. Yeah. Thank you very much, Paolo. So uh, that's very interesting. So there is not one, one reason, of course, like usual in these cases, but there are several reasons. But what I hear from you is that, uh, that there was not given a priority to that. People were not aware from all different sectors. So it was not just that one piece of the chain did not work, but the full chain was not designed in a way that it should work at the end. Thank you very much for that. I will come back to that in a second. So my second question would be to, uh, sorry, Paolo, we'll come back in a second. Just uh, uh, to Galina, the second question. Um, yeah, that was uh, that was very interesting. And I think a lot of us don't have um, Central Asia in mind when we speak about droughts. Um, so uh, we heard now from Paolo about flood, um, what was lacking in, in, in regard of early warning system. But for Central Asia, I think you showed that we are at a different stage, that there is no early warning system existing at the moment for the, for the region. So uh, for you, um, concretely now for Central Asia, what do you think is missing? And uh, what should be done to make an early warning system effective in the region? Thanks, Galina. <clears throat> Thank you. And uh, yeah, this uh, I uh, it's uh, it's the present. It's a really working system in the early warning uh, in uh, drought and possible floods in uh, in the Central Asia is uh, uh, by uh, provide by ICWC. And together with the Hydromet for uh, and the BVO Basin Organization, uh, Serdaria and Amudaria uh, Rivers of uh, uh, observation, uh, glaciers melting, snow depths and melting rates and analyze. And based uh, on the collection, this information, water resources of rivers are um, modeled uh, after this one and the result submitted to the Ministry of Water Agricultural uh, and uh, for decision maker, maker, making. And uh, the result, this result uh, tran uh, trans, uh, transmitted uh, to develop uh, of state, uh, state plans for uh, limiting water, supply and cropping patterns, for example, the example to, to decrease uh, the rice uh, like crop and however the change on information transfer to ministry, but not to, to the users, to the users, uh, to the uh, users uh, ad, uh, for adaptation information in uh, convenient for for users and uh, together with the recommendation with sufficient uh, time frequency and uh, but it's possible to make because uh, it's uh, we have a system of agrometeorological service it's possible to um, to trans transmit it to to this uh, service and from this service to the users. But now, unfortunately, is, is the, uh, this um, connection is not work. But the system is a really uh, good system. It, uh, it's a basin system. 
it's a uh, decision for all RLC basin in Amudaria River. And uh, uh, I, I think, I hope that in future it will be developed and, uh, for, <laughs> for improving. Yes, thanks a lot, Galina. So, um... Yeah, it's, it's good to hear that uh, the that you say the the basic structure is actually there with the with the with the interstate commission and also with the, with the agro meteorological services of the country. So, um, yeah, perhaps we can um, at the end also uh, tell a little bit that we are actually working with a lot of partners to uh, improve the, uh, the 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 drought preparedness in, in Central Asia and also in the Caucasus region. But uh, now I would like to go back to Paolo, and uh, I think you also wanted to respond to my to my short summary. Perhaps it was not completely correct, but perhaps also you could uh, um, allude to uh, what needs to happen really next in Germany. I think you already said we need a campaign for awareness, and I see there are already questions in this regard. And we need to perhaps also train uh, people better in different positions. So perhaps you could give some advice if you would have, uh, I don't know, uh, 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 the, the authority there to uh, really change something. What would you do? Yeah, I mean, I would, uh, for, uh, to begin with, um, identify areas that are exposed to risks. Yeah. Uh, Atal, but they are, they are valley, but they are also on the other side of the Rhine, they are similar. Uh, type of 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 catchments, yeah. That uh, that, for instance, the Sieg Valley, yeah, where I am by my university is situated. That is also a an area with industry historically situated, production site of steel industry, etc. Did uh, situated, sited uh, very close to the river at the bottom of the valley because that's the only way uh, where they where they have room to expand. Yeah, and and uh, and and uh, inform people, inform municipalities, etc. What sort of risks can occur? Yeah, and also inform the people in the in the areas. Yeah, and I am also uh, what I have, what I think a lesson that needs to be learned here is that social media, etc., are is all very nice, uh, but in an emergency like the one we had there, it's a total failure because we have power outages, yeah? Infrastructure, gas, potable water, electricity went out. So how do you reach people? So you need very basic instruments like sirens, like, uh, like uh, devices, yeah, that, that uh, warn people. And the people need to know ahead what to do in such an emergency, yeah? I think this is this is these are uh, this uh, I mean high tech and technology can be is very useful and 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 has enormous power informa informational power, but in such situation this might be uh, uh, this system might fail, yeah. Especially when it comes to reaching people in 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 in, in the disaster areas, yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot, Paolo. I think that was very insightful. And yeah. yeah, of course, these are things that when you design a system, you really need to think of that there is a power outage. I mean, it, it seems obvious, but uh, I think there is still a lot of these warn apps out. And in case the emergency hit, I think they're not useful, as you said. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, so, and then the last question is again on droughts for Galina. So a, a, a little bit the same uh, question as we just had for Paolo, forward looking. If you had the authority, how would you set up an early warning system that really works for Central Asia? You as a specialist from the region, what are your uh, views on that? Sorry, Galina, you're still muted. Uh, the analysis of available materials in the regional shows that in the country of central countries of Central Asia separately studies of this study. Monitoring of early warning and drought should be systematic. And, uh, but it's possible adopt in, uh, in fight uh, definition of drought in the regional for <clears throat> identification, which will allow to perform parameters uh, and the drought and have homogeneous series of information and drought, 
allowing to perform special and temporal analysis. And uh, in April 2001, uh, Carec uh, allowed uh, the Central Asia Regional Climate Information Platform, and this uh, initiative have uh, been undertaken to address key gaps in the regional uh, and uh, to access to climate information and related uh, knowledge base for adaptation and mitigation measure. It's, uh, I think that this is, uh, will, de will develop a common strategy at the level at the Central Asia state, st states. But uh, for, uh, uh, but we, uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, the, the, uh, for our opinion, and uh, to create, uh, create and implement of drought yearly warning uh, problems, there is uh, three uh, problems to, to, to should uh, to be addressed. First, it organization and the setting up of system to communicate to decision makers uh, organization to create the system for delivery early warning message to decision the makers and uh, makers and downstream users. It's the first. Second, it's technolo technological and uh, it's the data supply, monitoring, monitoring, GIS, RS development uh, system. And uh, uh, this is a methodological, uh, it's uh, this one is the need to adapt uh, the concept of drought and the concept of st standardization drought index and concept of uh, concept of trigger. Uh, if I have a time, I will explain some because the concept of for example, I fear, I fear, Galina, we are already behind. We don't have to go detail to go into into the details of these solutions. But I think that was already a very good uh, um, introduction, overview of what should happen next in Central Asia. And perhaps throughout the discussion session later, we have uh, a little bit more opportunity to go in more detail. Thanks a lot to Paolo and you for these very insightful um, answers. And uh, as I said, we come back to the discussion with all of you and with further experts that we have on the table here um, later. And with that, I'll give it to you for the next engagement of our participants. Thanks. Katrin, over to you. Thanks very much, Valentin. Yeah, and we'll go right into our next poll question now. Uh, Mario, if you could uh, put that on, because uh, after hearing from our two case examples, Germany and Central Asia, we want to know from you, in your view, is the policy framework for drought, drought plan, or flat, or flat plan, or for flood in your country practically non-existing, non not sufficient, okay, or actually already advanced? So, yeah, we've really we've really heard from the two countries. Oh, and if anyone has uh, issues in finding the link again, maybe uh, we can paste the polyf link back into the chat for those who, who want to reconnect. It's polyv.com slash GWP. Um, we have already heard a lot about the actual connection between uh, measures in place and the actual communication or the observing system, the knowledge about the risk or the, the upcoming risk and, uh, and the actual translation into action. Uh, maybe failure yeah, of, of communication networks uh, uh, because of the hazard. So, so I think there are many aspects that we've heard about uh, from our two experts already, and, and all of those would be part of the policy framework for drought and also really the last mile on really getting the early warning um, into, um, yeah, um, uh, into place and into action. So here we have most people saying non-sufficient and uh, we'll pass it on then to the next question. In your view, is the drought early warning system in your country? Oh, okay, so this is, <laughs> um, I think uh, we can maybe pass this question by. Um, we've already, 
Okay. Although, sorry, this is on the early warning system. Sorry, no. Now we have the early warning system. Beforehand, it was on the policy, and now we're on the early warning system. So um, is the drought or a flood early warning system in your country monitoring uh, and forecasting um, actual risk assessment, so knowledge about the risk, and then also the, the communication to stakeholders to, uh, to provide the basis for early, uh, early action, early warning and early action. Is that in place? Is it non-existing, not sufficient, okay, or actually good? So um, has it been shown to, to save lives? So most people in the session are actually thinking that the early warning system is okay. So that is a really good result actually. Um, and we might be able to touch on that as well uh, later on in the session. So thank you very much. And without further ado, I'm gonna um, go on to our next session really Happy um, that we have our two um, next uh, speakers here. Uh, we have uh, Graciela Olua, who is a weather forecaster at the Indonesian Agency for Meteorology, and Eric Minali, who is a Youth Mapper's regional ambassador. And those two, um, hi Graciela and hi Eric, hi. Um, those two youth champions um, have actually won our um, a global integrated flood and, drought, uh, flood and drought management competition for youth projects uh, on end-to-end -end early warning systems for flood and droughts um, that we ran earlier this year uh, by the integrated drought management program and the associated program on flood management. And yeah, so uh, we really uh, want to hear uh, from you now to uh, about um, yeah, about your view on early warning systems. So I'll start with Graciela, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Catherine. Uh, okay, hi everyone, good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, thank you for the chance given to me. I would present our project called Awake Awareness and Knowledge for Early Warning. Uh, I work as a weather forecaster in Papua, the most Eastern part of Indonesia. Uh, next. Well, as we know, Indonesia is a country with one of the highest rates of disasters in the world. Not only earthquakes, but also uh, floods, landslides, droughts, and forest fire are also relatively high. Uh, we are forced to live in harmony with disaster. Uh, for that reason, disaster risk reduction and preparedness play a crucial role in strengthening the country's resilience. Uh, as you can see, the disaster trend in Indonesia tend to increase each year. Last year, it reached more than 5,000 events. Next, 99% uh, of the events are categorized as hydrometeorological disaster. Flood, landslide, and extreme weather are on the top list. On 2021, the hydrometeorological disaster caused 500 uh, people to die and negatively impacted more than 1 billion people. This makes us realize that there are people who are not aware of the potential disasters around them. They, they are still not familiar with the early warning system, the early detections of hazards coming on their way. They don't comprehend the idea of being the first responders in protect, protecting their own selves. Uh, as a weather forecaster, we truly realize that uh, we're really aware that an ideal early warning system is not only about uh, how advanced the system is, but also how effective the warning is in helping the society. A well-informed community, of, of course, would take the early warning messages wisely. Next. In order to reduce that risk, training and preparedness education must be held frequently in an inclusive way. This is why we created this AWAKE project. By AWAKE, we call, uh, we hope people will be aware and conscious and alert to their surroundings. Uh, this project aims to create educational learning that focuses on improving the preparedness and ability of children seven to 15 years old, as well as people with disabilities, so that they can respond uh, appropriately to warnings. Incorporating all the four learning styles, visual, auditory reading, writing, and kinesthetic, we want to equip them to at least have the thought of, uh, is this environment uh, around me safe enough? 
and furthermore this group of little soul uh, would bring meaningful impact to their family as well as to the community uh, the second group we aim to help is people with disabilities as the center as they are considered to be one of the most vulnerable groups we will provide our learning materials by using a backlist way, such as a guidance book with braille and a video with a sign language translator for the heart of hearing people. Uh, by memorizing some basic yet essential information, they would be more confident when disaster come on their way. Okay, next. Uh, these are my team who helped me to develop this project. Uh, all of us uh, work for Indonesian Agency for Meteorology, our MKG. Our team divided into three groups. This past three months of implementation went great, although uh, there were challenges, especially in visitation to small villages, but the challenges were solvable. Next, uh, as, we, as we know, uh, they said it takes a, villages, a village to raise a kid. Therefore, I'm sure we need an ecosystem to build a resilience community. That being the case, a pentahelix collaboration is the answer. The role of academia, uh, businessman, community, government, and mass media are needed in building an insightful environment to save more lives in the future. Uh, next, this is what we have done so far. The first, we have a virtual roundtable meeting. A roundtable means we notice that everyone sitting as at it is equal. We invited all the public sector to sit together, hear the perspective from people with disabilities. And Mr. Ramesh from the WM also attended to give his support statement. That means a lot to us. This meeting lasts for two hours and it was beyond our expectation. We invited uh, 35 organizations in Papua and there were 140 uh, participants to join the talk. Uh, so the next day, uh, our meeting was uh, all over the local newspaper. Uh, next, we also consult, consult with the expert, the government, and also the local community to hear their, their experience and perspective. In our agency, there are seven meteorological stations are helping to implement this project and start this awake movement. Next, in addition, we have created a few tools that we will use to teach the children. There are comic, song and choreography, animation video, and games. And at the end of the project, we will share the learning material on our website so that everyone could use it. Next. Implementa implementation part is the hardest because the capability of children one to another areas are different. As a result, we ought to create uh, different levels of games. Different approaches have to be made. We cannot only do the visitation at school, but also we have to do it at the church community. I found the interesting fact that kids love to go to school more than uh, kids love to go to the church more than they love to to go to the school. We also have to prepare for all the pos the possibilities since that not every village has the electricity. So yeah, here you can see we have various board game ladder, bingo, pairing picture, and etc. So far, the most effective way to teach them is through songs and choreography. We created an easy listening song so everyone could catch up with the lyric and the music faster. Next. Believe me, I've been teaching kids uh, about the weather since about 10 to 11 years ago. But to be honest, it was all boring and not effective. Uh, you can see on this picture, it was 2017, if I'm not mistaken, compared to 2022. Uh, with the awake idea. On awake visitation, my team and I have never seen uh, kids exciting in learning about the weather. Okay, next. Uh, we have visited seven out of uh, 25 schools. We expected there will be delay due to the long school break, new semester, and some festival and parades celebrating Indonesian Ind Independence Day. Okay, uh, finally, Next, finally, getting fully support from the WMO, Global Water Partnership and Water Union Network. To implement this inclusive education really means a lot to us and our society. We can proudly claim that we are awake to be safe. Uh, I promise this project will sustain. We will fight for equality on disaster preparedness. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Graziela. And I have to say that we were also really convinced and, and taken by, by your idea and really are um, 
yeah, really are amazed uh, by how the implementation is working. And you can see on the photos, really, this, this interactive approach is, uh, is really uh, working well. Um, so, so now I pass it on to our second winner of the competition, uh, Eric Minali. Uh, Eric, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, uh, very happy to be here with you. And uh, yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, thank you so much. So my name is Eric Tamba, Youth Marpros Regional Ambassador. So briefly, Youth Marpros is a uh, um, group of local chapters in universities that use geospatial technology to address different challenges in the world. So one of the challenges that we are addressing in this project is um, how to address early warning system uh, in local communities. Next slide, please. Yeah, so the real challenge that was uh, really addressed here is that um, there are really um, no data on the on, on on vulnerable communities. So if those people are are not represented on the map, it means that um, they are left behind with these development challenges, including um, the maps that uh, really need to be uh, addressed to those people who are going to respond to floods or even the rescue team as well. And next slide, please. So the main drivers, as I saw in the case study of Germany as well, there's um, the cities that are uh, mostly um, unplanned and you can see there's a river crossing by. And so basically whenever heavy storms hit there, that the, the main challenge there um, is floods and like people are not really aware, like every year is recurring and like when, when will they, uh, what will they do? Um, the idea behind like what will they do on those occasions is not really revealed to them. Next slide, please. So um, yeah, we, we opted to go again for um, uh, two case studies in Tanzania. So we are going to um, implement this to Morogoro Municipal as well as Ifakara Town Council. Next slide, please. So um, yeah, this is a closer look. You can see there's a liver closing by, this is the Fakala Town Council. And uh, yeah, um, on the uh, right side, you can see the residential areas and the river crossing by in between the cities. Next slide, please. So the main uh, idea was to uh, map the flood protection zones and um, evacuation routes to this uh, flood protection zone so that people in the local communities can understand like which route to take or even the responders coming into um, in this emergency situation to understand the geographical area of that area of, of, of um, what they are going to do to attend um, people who are affected by floods. Next slide, please. Yeah, um, so the objectives were one uh, to map the, um, to, uh, to do community data gathering, and this was through remote mapping and free data collection. And next slide, please. And so basically after having the, the data from the field and uh, remote mapped, we are um, going to map the flood protection zone using um, GIS techniques. And this is through terrain analysis and uh, also um, network, uh, um, the network analysis. Next slide, please. And so the final thing is actually uh, very important on how to bring out these projects to the community, like disseminating the information to them through workshops and trainings. And this is gonna involve um, the local government um, institutions like academia, as well as uh, NGOs who work closely with these communities. And another thing is really um, very touching is that Whenever we have this data, it's really important to put it, that data out there so that people can uh, use that whenever they um, they need to use the data. So this data is open source and it's gonna be available in OpenStreetMap as well as climate risk database that is available in around these communities. Next slide, please. Yeah, so the extra mile option that we had actually right now we're in a state of the map conference in Florence, Italy. And one of the amazing thing is that um, these uh, actions by youth mappers uh, will be featured in a, a, a publication. And hopefully this project, um, from this project will have a publication sent. And uh, I mean, we'll have a article publication featured as well in this book so that um, we, 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 it's available for people to understand how we went about this project and later on maybe implement it. Next slide, please. 
Yes, um, so the theory of change is actually um, making this more sustainable and um, through knowledge transformation, as well as um, bringing in more partnerships so that they can all come together and collaborate through um, tackling this problem in uh, these flood vulnerable areas. Next slide, please. Yeah, and as well, um, because this is very community based, so we use um, geographical citizen science where also non um, professionals can come in and collaborate and bring in the ideas on how their community works because we understand not only professionals can you can understand that from remotely, but then you need also to have the community in there um, helping you out. Next slide, please. Yeah, and um, so we completed the phase one where we mapped the remote mapping um, task, like we mapped the buildings. Over more more than thirty thousand buildings were mapped, and one thousand five hundred kilometer floods were mapped in these two flood vulnerable areas. So next slide, please. Yeah, so the summary of this, um, I mean, the amazing work that people um, we try to do. Um, I, I'll also post the link there in the uh, chat so that you can see it. Next slide, please. Yeah, so to catch on about the project because it's still on progress. Um, we have our Instagram accounts goes by Youth Marpers and all that. So you can follow us on Twitter, WhatsApp, and yeah, from there we can get in touch and give you more updates on that. Next slide, please. Yeah, thank you so much. No, thank you, Eric. And I think here we have really seen also this combination of harvesting this open, open data and uh, and really turning that into a part of the early warning system and knowing the risk and really, yeah, uh, including stakeholders into this whole process. Um, I, I especially liked this idea of the uh, geographical citizen science. So thank you very much and uh, good, luck, good luck with the further implementation of the project. I'll give it now over to Valentin uh, to start the, the discussion. Yes. Thanks again for um, this very interesting presentation and we're really happy with, with our two winners. So uh, thanks again and congratulations for having such great proposals and really implementing them in such a great way. So I would like now to invite all of the speakers here uh, to the virtual podium, um, as well as Katrin and perhaps also all our colleagues from the um, APFM and IDMP technical support units that are also here close to us. Um, so we can uh, look a little bit into the questions of the chat and perhaps take one or two questions directly that have been posed there. I think there is a very interesting discussion going on. Um, first of all, I saw a very interesting comment from Maizara Al-Yazi. Uh, I don't know if you would be willing to come to the floor and perhaps explain a little bit what you uh, have written in the chat. If, if yes, I would ask you to unmute and perhaps pose your question. We cannot hear you, but you are unmuted. So perhaps you have an issue with your device, sorry. Okay, that, that, that doesn't, so I'll, I'll uh, repeat. He has worked on the water Y city concept in Willicher Bonn bon Boyle, that's in Germany during his master program. And they noticed so far that the local community is keen to learn more about flood and drought adaptation. Mm -hmm. They really organize monthly meetings now to learn more. Uh, about what they can do in case of warnings. Paolo, is that something that you have heard of more? And uh, 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 are you aware of such initiatives? And do you think that's a good way forward if there is this kind of grassroots movement? Uh, this is uh, very good news. It's the first time I hear, uh, hear about it. Um, but exactly that is the way in which we, we, we need to move. And I, I think, uh, especially in Germany, communities are, uh, well organized there is a strong cohesion also especially in the rural areas so i think uh, if if this if especially if this catastrophe of last year has has has, uh, has shown something then we we can then then it is being implemented here i i think this is a very is a very a very positive message here yeah. yeah i think as well i think this is really something yeah, but that can only come when 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 there is an initial awareness there. No, it should not just yeah. happen after a disaster has has striked us. Yeah, uh, we, there yeah. was yeah. Please, Paolo. Yeah, you're muted. Sorry. 
if 70 years before such a catastrophe has not occurred, we cannot blame people that they lose the recollection. Yeah. But of course, now the things seem to be changing rapidly. Yeah. Yeah, Thank thanks a lot. I really invite all participants to perhaps raise their hands if they want to pose a question. Uh, we have seen, for example, also a very interesting question from uh, uh, Tinebib, um, who was uh, especially interested in the presentation of uh, Graziella. Uh, I don't know if you have seen the question. Um, wait, I'm just scrolling to find it again. Sorry for that. Um, here we are. Uh, uh, what kind of early warning have you been referring to, Kratziela? What is used there in Indonesia? This was, I think, only on floods, but perhaps you can explain that a little bit more and answer Tinebib's question. Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, we are referring to early warning for uh, flood or extreme weather in Indonesia. It is not really to the draft because uh, the case of the draft is not that much as the extreme weather or that uh, flood and landslide, which uh, increased significantly for the last couple of years. So yeah, uh, and how we produce our early warning, uh, basically it's we are using impact-based forecast and uh, we have rather uh, weather, weather for the radar, weather, rather weather, uh, yeah, but it is still not enough, uh, not so many, so many uh, uh, weather, uh, rather for, for, for area in Indonesia, it's so raw, raw, large, so yeah. And, and then, oh, and then the, the, the most important is we are still using the social media and radio to broadcast our early warning. That is why we, we, we think that have to raising this awareness about early warning concept is necessary. Thanks a lot, Graziella. I think that was uh, yeah the, the answer. I hope uh, Tine is happy. Otherwise, we can also give her um, uh, the floor, of course. Uh, I also saw a very interesting comment uh, from my colleague Giacomo Teruggi, who is uh, here close by who suggested a combination of, of different media. I just wondered if you could perhaps elaborate that a little bit more, what you meant with uh, a combination of different media that, that should uh, really do the alerts. Yes, yes. thank you, Valentin. Uh, wait a second, we have a Yes. Can you hear me now? Yeah, go ahead. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Um, so what I meant is uh, mainly the fact that uh, um, the social media, I think, can play an important role, um, especially on, on mobile phones. Uh, um, I'm referring mainly to technology, which myself I cannot uh, use, like uh, Twitter, uh, TikTok or whatever, uh, but that I know that have a wide uh, dissemination um, ability to, especially towards the, the, the youngest uh, generation that have a, a mobile phone. I, I'm mainly thinking about cases like the one of, of Germany. But at the same time, we also have to recognize that uh, uh, the same tools cannot be uh, used or do not have the same uh, uh, impact on all the population. So for example, even myself, as I said, I would not be able to receive uh, an alert to, to Twitter. And they can imagine that uh, uh, people that are one generation older than me are probably uh, even less exposed to this kind of, uh, of technology. So for that, it would be good to have a, a traditional alert system like a network of sirens, which are triggering the intervention of something like the Civil Defense Authority to evacuate the um, older layers of the population um, and, and therefore uh, make an optimal use of uh, the different media that we have available and not focus only on um, as we say, one solution fits all uh, in terms of uh, uh, dissemination of information. Also, for what relates to the uh, raising awareness, I think there are different uh, methodologies. We've seen from the excellent example of uh, Papua New Guinea that education plays a major role. Uh, anecdotically, I remember a, a colleague, a, a university professor on, uh, on hydrology that uh, had recently moved to the Netherlands and that admitted that he came to know how to react to a flood alert uh, in his new hometown from his seven-year-old kid 
who was educated in school on how to react to the to the alert. So these, I think, are very um, very important things. But at the same time, uh, we could also think about having periodical. Um, I don't know, awareness campaign to TV or uh, newspaper billboards, mm, maybe not on a continuous basis, but maybe on the on the season where those uh, extreme events like floods and drought are more likely to, to happen. So this was just to specify a little bit more. Thanks. I think that was a very nice overview. Thanks a lot, Giacomo, for that input and all the good ideas. And I think it's a very nice example that, that shows that we can learn a lot from the youth as well, what you said with the seven-year-olds. A, a child that, that explained the parents actually how to react on, on, on flood warnings. Um, perhaps uh, we have now also a, a little bit time left uh, to go back to Galina to the suggestion that, that you had made about uh, how to implement drought actually in, in, in Central Asia. Um, I don't know, what do you think is there the role at the moment of the civil society and the media and so on? Are they included or how, how are if how is information about, um, I'm not speaking about early warning since we said that's not really existing, but the information perhaps about uh, droughts, is there something that is communicated to the people or is there a complete uh, uh, silence about that? Uh, it's um, yes. I think that uh, there is a communication between the uh, the specialist and uh, with the, from different country. But uh, I want to say that uh, the I, I start to explain why they need to to look into address the, to con the concept of uh, drought and concept of the um, of the <clears throat> drought and for the uh, standard uh, standardization drought indexes because for example in uh, central asia absolutely different uh, the <clears throat> the uh, what it um, means the drought drought for example how how we can now <laughs> make it create the early warming system because we don't have a the similar uh, understanding what is the uh, drought or what is the um, uh, indexes uh, for example in uh, kazakhstan the drought it's uh, it's a government document and drought is a, uh, if the 20 days or more uh, of relative of humidity of 30 percentage less during the day with moisture content of 35 millimeters or less uh, in one meter of soil layers but it's uh, this it, this one is a government document and also in kyrgyzstan the some 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 the same but in uh, uzbekistan and tajikistan there is not government uh, documents about what it means, this uh, drought and uh, standardization indexes. And um, uh, I think that we, we should start from this one in uh, Central Asia, because it's need to, um, to make some, some platform it's, uh, for, uh, for our position to this uh, problem and to 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 the um, it's um, for for our viewpoint the drought should be considered as a cause and effect process and uh, we start with this one I thanks think. a lot yeah thanks a lot Galina I think this is a very good point that you say that there is actual the knowledge and the technical monitoring if it's if it's there it's not told to the people in a language that they can really understand and pick up and react to. So I think that's also something what, what yeah, Graziella alluded to and what we've heard from Paolo as well. So uh, I've seen that Giacomo, you raised your hand as well. Uh, perhaps uh, if you want to uh, very quickly uh, 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 comment again, and then I think we need to uh, soon wrap up as well, unfortunately. Please unmute yourselves there.
Thanks, Valentin. Thanks, Catherine. I will do very quickly. It's not convenient because we are using the team room. For, uh, I have a question to Paolo Galina. That Paolo, I, you know, it was quite a surprise to all of us 2021 German flood, which we believe we thought maybe only developing country will have a lot of damage, but it's not even German and Europe that we had a lot of big damage. And I'm wondering, Paolo, is there any government approach that they want to change or improve their policy for, for example, as you mentioned, the infrastructure part, the building can built, uh, can be built like in 100 years frequency because so far they didn't have a, such a four times higher frequency like last year. So I, I'm wondering that German government must have been thinking and considered to improve any policy strategy or prevent the, uh, another disaster because as you, we all know there's climate change, the flood and drought will severely happen again and again. So that's my question to Paolo. And Galina is not I a think question. Mean we, don't have the time. We're in, we only have three minutes left. I think we have to okay. leave it with one question. I will stop. Sorry. But just one quick, quick comment that we do have a Central Asia project funded by um, World Bank that we are supporting not only flood, but even in the Amudaria, we're trying to support the drought, seasonal subseasonal forecasting with the capacity building. So that will help to Central Asia that WMO has been working with our partners that I want to inform to you. That could be a good solution as well. Thanks. Thank you very much, Corinne, for that input and for the information. Um, Paolo, can you very shortly answer the question of Corinne yeah. about the government approach before we ask Marcelo to wrap up? So, I mean, um, Germany has a federal level and a very strong uh, state level. So states are actually, uh, federal states are quite independent in, sort, in the way they're running their own uh, uh, ministries and systems. But I mean, Germany is still struggling to come to terms with what happened last year. I mean, it, it, it exceeded anything imaginable. And um, now there is, are, are a lot of... Uh, um, uh, working groups being formed. There are experts being consulted to 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 understand what 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 went wrong. Yeah, uh, but I mean, uh, we have to understand in such a in such a, a narrow valley, in such a narrow valley with historically grown uh, uh, infrastructure. Yeah, old bridges, villages, etc. I mean, there's nothing that you can do. Uh, uh, directly, I mean, all you can do is to intervene on the on the population, on the on the warning, on the awareness programs, and I think uh, this is 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 <clears throat> is what 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 uh, institutions are going to 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 realize and are going to to address in the in the in the years to come. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Paolo. I have responded uh, to this, uh, to what you wanted to say, Rin. <clears throat> I think, yes, thanks a lot, Paolo. And I think yeah, it's not just the German government, but uh, governments all around the world, uh, yeah. and especially in Europe. I mean, during this flood, so it is a wake up call. I think all the question is always, how long is this memory that something needs to be done from the, from the official side? But uh, yeah, there were so many uh, interesting discussions now, and uh, we would really like to continue all of them with, with you. And I hope we stay in contact. Please inform yourself about our websites, droughtmanagement.info and uh, uh, floodmanagement.info, how to get in contact with us. We have a help desk as well, where we can uh, continue this discussion together. And we're always um, looking for partners and, and more input or, or uh, uh, yeah, uh, also projects where we can get engaged and, and support. But uh, with this, uh, I would, uh, uh, from my side already, uh, thank you very much for joining. And uh, before we end and we uh, say the final goodbye, we would like to ask Marcelo Uriburi from the um, Argentinian uh, Space, uh, 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 excuse me, Satellite Agency, mm -hmm. Uh, to wrap up the session because he is uh, the chair of the Standing Committee on Hydrology of the World Meteorological Organization. And uh, he leads this group of experts and he is also working very much in this field. Perhaps you can summarize for us what you have taken from this, uh, from this discussion and uh, what we have to take forward uh, in our work. Perhaps in uh, a few bullet points, Marcelo, because our time is already over. Thank you very much. 
and thanks everybody for joining. Thank you very much, uh, Valentin. Yeah, I'm very, I'm very happy to to join this important meeting, and uh, we've been enjoying a very very interesting um, discussions and presentations. And a special mention to the winners of the competition, Graciela and Eric. I took some note, but I know we are running very short of time, so I just wanted to mention one thing. Uh, Valentin, you said in the introduction that we really face a big challenge with respect to ensuring every person in this uh, world uh, to get access to or to be served by early warning systems within the next five years. And from the presentation we saw, I think the challenge is even higher because it's not just enough with serving people with early warning systems, but we all know how to get to know what to do with that information. And uh, we saw examples, particularly the, the case of Germany that uh, Paolo presented, a very interesting one. So we really have this uh, challenge there. So simply that, I just wanted to, to uh, I, I would like to meet you all in the following, in the couple, in the following two days with the annual meetings. I hope to meet you there. I found many colleagues and friends in here, so I'm very happy again to be here. Thank you very much and the floor is yours for me. Thank you very much, Marcelo. Thank you very much to all of our speakers today. I think we had a very rich uh, and uh, an exciting session here, interactive. We learned uh, from our audience. So as Marcelo said, um, if you're interested, please join us for our annual meetings of the flood and drought management programs. Uh, which will take place tomorrow and on Saturday um, on site in Stockholm, actually, but also virtually. And, um, and yeah, with that, uh, a big thanks to the audience for your questions and comments and, and interaction. And, um, and I'm closing the session. Thank you and goodbye. See you. Thank you. Bye.